It's news making international headlines. U.S. President Joe Biden and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin having a phone discussion, we're told, to try and resolve the Ukraine crisis. But apparently that discussion yielded no breakthrough. Uh, there are concerns that, in fact, war could break out amid fears that Russia is planning to invade Ukraine. Now, Moscow denies this but says it could take unspecified military technical action unless a series of demands are met. In the backdrop, Biden warning Putin that the U.S. is equally prepared for several scenarios. What should you and I make of this watching from our own vantage point? Well, let's make sense of it now. Bring in Professor John Stremlau from the Department of International Relations with Wits University. Prof, it's great to have you on the program on this incredibly important story. Thanks very much indeed for your time. I want to start with what some people might consider the, the foundational questions, right? So there's fear of a war breaking out because of Russia's apparent intention to invade Ukraine. Moscow says they have no such intention. The U.S., though, is not buying it. Why? Well, the, the U.S. is cynical about Vladimir Putin, and I am cynical about Vladimir Putin. I mean, seldom in the field of human conflict have uh, a war that has enormous consequences for the people involved, obviously, uh, determined uh, by the whims of one man. I mean, he is an autocrat. He's changed the Constitution so he can stay in power till 2036. He knows Joe Biden faces a very tough election in 2024. The, the, the Russians have interfered in past elections. Uh, meanwhile, Putin has legitimate concerns from his standpoint about NATO getting closer to Russia. The problem is that the Romanians and the Poles, who the Poland that borders on, on uh, Ukraine, uh, joined voluntarily the West. And Ukraine, if it had its brothers, would also, because that's where the money and the jobs and the, and the freedom is. And don't forget that when uh, there was a revolution uh, against the uh, Putin puppet, uh, Viktor uh, uh, Yankelovich, in 2014, Putin responded by breaking the rules of international order and invading Crimea. So Putin can talk all he wants about the buildup of 130,000 troops around the borders of Ukraine, but it does look like he's getting ready for war. And he may not decide to do it, but we don't know. Right, right. Ukraine is obviously at the center of this, and uh, the president in that country has come out to say that what is taking place is some kind of, well, part of what he actually mentioned is that the worst thing is actually unfolding now, and that's panic actually taking place. He says that could lead uh, to creating an environment that is fertile for war. Does he have a point? Yes, he does have a point, of course. Uh, you know, the, there, there are legitimate differences. I, I'm, I'm always smiling when Putin says that uh, the, the NATO are, are all pawns of the United States. That's, that's crazy, especially since Donald Trump was president, for heaven's sakes. The Europeans know full well where their interests are, the West Europeans, and the Ukrainians. But the Zelensky, who is president of Ukraine, mm. is um, in a difficult position because uh, he doesn't want to be panicked himself and, and, and mobilize. On the other hand, if the Russians attack, um, they're, 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 he, he, whether he can rally this, his, his forces and his people in a, in a determined resistance, I don't know. But the U.S. has said it will not send troops. And uh, the military assistance will, will come from NATO. But NATO membership, it, it's not. It doesn't have. So there's no obligation to go under Article 5 of NATO to go to Ukraine's defense. What, what, what Zelensky seems to be saying and what the Europeans are saying is, look, we don't think that Putin is really ready to run the risk of, of, of a full invasion. But we understand what his long-term game is, which is to recapture some of the prominence of Russia that the Soviet Union had and a buffer zone in Eastern Europe. Well, that's Putin's preference, but what about the people who live there? Right, right, exactly. And interestingly enough, um, according to some reports, even the people living in Ukraine aren't quite sure what to believe, right? On the one hand, the U.S. and I think the U.K. is the latest country to advise its citizens leaving, uh, living in Ukraine to leave that country. On the other hand, Russia is saying this is all just war hysteria. I can only imagine what's going through the minds of Ukrainians who, again, I insist, are arguably at the center of this. Well, you've got to look at, at what the Ukrainians are doing, and they have fought valiantly and at some sacrifice in terms of lost lives 
in the Bombas region of eastern Ukraine, where Putin has been fomenting insurgents there and assisting them in, a, in, in what is a really a covert Russian insurrection that, that uh, there's a Russian population there. I have no doubts. I've been to Kiev, and I, I used to dialogue a lot with the Soviets about southern African co conflicts in the 70s and 80s. And I, I understand that, that Ukraine was an important part of the Soviet Union, but the Ukrainian people did rise up and would like to join the West, but they're not about to be included into NATO. But Biden will not give Putin the one thing that Putin wants right now, which is a pledge that it's off the table of ever joining NATO because NATO works on voluntary applications and then vetting. And there's too much corruption in, in, in Ukraine probably to merit a, 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 a membership, even in the best of circumstances. But at the moment, um, that, that is where the deadlock is over the question of whether or not the U.S. will say to, to Putin, we guarantee that Ukraine will never be part of Russia. Ukraine does border on Russia after all. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's concerns that this may very well spill over into actual military action. It's being described potentially as a kind of World War III scenario. Is that overstating it or pretty accurate? Yeah, that is overstating it. I am a child of the Cold War. I remember very vividly as, as, a, as an undergraduate in college when the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred. That was a near-death experience for millions and millions and millions of people. This is a local dispute by a regional power, although it would like to be taken more seriously on the global stage, but it's not China for sure, um, Russia. And Russia wants a buffer in the Eastern Europe and, and get control of, 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 of Ukraine like it has control of Belarus. So it could send in its troops when it wants to. It has a puppet there. It's a satellite. And, and that's really where it's focused. Now, you, you could, because they have nuclear weapons, uh, and the U.S. has nuclear weapons, do a scenario, worst case, of escalation. But I don't think that's in the cards at all. And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, you know, China's watching this very closely for its reasons with Taiwan. And so there are lar larger stakes, but by and large, it's a local uh, conflict. It's not a, a new Cold War. It's not a new Cold War, in my view. Yeah, right. Uh, Ukraine, as far as I understand, is a non-permanent member of the United Nations. I'm trying to try and place who is best suited to be a mediator here in a context where even a direct phone call between Biden and Putin didn't lead to any kind of breakthrough. Do you envision there being anyone on the global stage who might be able to successfully mediate the situation out? Well, uh, I'm a great fan of South Africa, and I think it's, it's, it's proven itself uh, capable of, of negotiating with a former enemy and turning it into an adversary that then disappeared. That is the Nationalist Party. So there, there is no question that, that Cyril Ramaphosa and the South Africans really do have a, 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 a possibility of playing some sort of a role it's just that with all of the Europeans, the British, the French, the Germans playing roles, and, and it's really down be, between Biden and, and Putin, but there may be a moment. Now, South Africa has been very quiet about this issue, and, and that's made me uncomfortable because this is an issue where you should say, look, if the, Romani if the Ukrainian people want to reassociate with the Russians and you do a, a referendum and it's internationally supervised, fine, fine. But if they want to associate with the West, that's also fine mm. because they are an independent sovereign state and they've been an independent sovereign state as long as South Africa has been a democracy for about 30 years. So let's get real here. The, the, you know, Putin's trying to change the game, change the rules of the game. And, and, uh, and I don't see where a mediator could come from, frankly, right now. Um, but uh, they did have the Minsk agreement on Bombas, but it hasn't been honored. That was done in, in, uh, in Belarus. I, I don't know. Sure. And in the interim, I imagine we all just hold our breath and hope that the worst case scenario doesn't unfold. Thanks very much indeed for helping us a better understand the story from our vantage point. Uh, it's great to have you on the program. And I guess we'll keep watching it, as I say, with the rest of the world as it unfolds. John Strimlau is uh, with the International Relations Department at Wits University. Prof, once again, thanks very much indeed.